ask for your uh, indulgence for a minute. Uh, 52 years ago today, my wife walked down the aisle in a beautiful white dress. She had no idea what she was getting herself into. God works in strange ways in our lives. When I was uh, 19, uh, I was in college and I skipped school and went to a conference and I heard uh, one of the best known preachers in America and uh, uh, I remember the sermon to this day that he preached. It had three points. Dream a dream, tell a dream, do a dream. And I cannot tell you how profoundly that sermon influenced me. Because that's exactly what I've done. I dreamed a dream of a church that, 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 that this... Uh, a church like this. Then I started talking to people about it. And then we started doing things together. And uh, God has accomplished incredible things. I'm telling you this story because we're having an, a conf we're going to have a conference here. We're calling it Awaken, August 7th and 8th. It'll be uh, 6.30 to 8.30 both nights. And uh, I believe God wants to do in some of your hearts exactly what he did in my heart that day. I, I, I believe he wants to start something. He wants to stir up something. He wants to, he wants to move in your life in the kind of way that the rest of your life, you're going to be doing something bigger than just uh, pleasing yourself. You're going to be part of the divine agenda in your lifetime. And I believe if you will give God a chance, he might surprise you by what he does in your heart. Our dear Heavenly Father, you left us this incredible psalm, Psalm 119. And in it you tell us again and again that your scriptures have a uh, potential to make us radically different people. And I pray that your spirit would guide our thinking this morning. I pray that uh, we would sense the wonder of your good work in us. And then I pray that we would hide our, your word in our heart that we might not sin against you. In Christ's name, amen. I'm reading a book on uh, Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders. I've read several books, but I like this one because it tells the background of more of the Rough Riders. So most books are about Teddy, and you don't get to know much about the Rough Riders, but this tells a bunch of stories about the guys who were the actual Rough Riders. One of them was a man named uh, Captain Alan Caprons. His grandfather was in the army and was killed in the Mexican-American War. His father was in the army and uh, was in the Calvary in uh, the American West. And before he became a Rough Rider, he was in the Seventh Calvary. Uh, 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 fighting the uh, uh, Apache Indians in uh, Oklahoma. But he took a leave of absence from the army to join the Rough Riders. Uh, he was only 24 years old, but there was something about the guy that was awesome. And because this was a volunteer uh, uh, military unit, they elected their own captains, and they voted him to be the captain of the uh, L Company. And uh, Roosevelt and uh, Leonard Wood were so impressed with him that when they landed on the island of Cuba in the Spanish-American War, they made his company the lead company. 
Uh, they landed, slept the night on the ground because their supplies didn't get there. And uh, the next day, they started advancing on the Spanish. They had trained to be a cavalry company, but they couldn't get the horses over to Cuba, so they just made them all infantry. And uh, the Spanish had set up a uh, crossfire trap. And uh, uh, Captain uh, Capron's uh, company uh, walked into it. Uh, and then he had to make a, uh, an incredibly hard decision. Uh, he could hold his position till the other troops arrived uh, at the risk of his life, or he could fall back, and that would create a disaster because all the troops would start bunching up. And on that day, uh, his true character came through and uh, he held his position, and he was one of the first uh, uh, Rough Riders uh, to die in the Spanish-American War. Um, uh, he lived and died by character commitments that he had made. Uh, he simply lived out that day who he had decided to be. In some ways, this is exactly what Psalm 19, uh, verse 9, is trying to say to us. At some point, we all have to decide, what kind of person do I really want to be? Uh, not to decide is to decide whether you know it or not. And King David wrote this. How does a young man set straight his way in life? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. The very first question that David asked in verse 9 is a question that everyone has to ask. And the younger you are when you ask this question, the better off you'll be. And this is basically, uh, I, I'm using the Septuagint reading, how does a young man set his path straight in life? Young ladies, you're all included too. How does a person set a right pathway in life? How do you do that? Uh, uh, if we don't ask ourselves this question, we end up being uh, reactionary to life. And we don't really live out a character at all. We just react to the moment. So everybody in this room, at one point or another, should ask themselves, what kind of person do I really want to be? And basically, this is going to fall into two categories. It's easier than you think. I've known Christians who didn't come out and say it, but this is really what they wanted. They wanted the option to do wrong whenever they wanted to do wrong. They just didn't want the repercussions that go along with it. You see? And then I've known Christians who really, really wanted to do the right thing. Uh, I've known Christians who loved the TV commercial, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> and then I've known Christians who said, I don't care where I am, I really, really want to, I, I want to do this right. I want to be a good person. I want to be a noble soul. So at some point, we all have to, we got to ask ourselves this question. What kind of person do I really want to be? I want to get a little more pushy. Brother, what kind of man do you really want to be? Do you want to be a man who never cheats on your wife because that's the kind of man you are? 
Or do you want to be a man who cheats on your wife if you think you can get away with it? So you got to decide that yourself. Ladies, I'm not letting you off the hook either. <laughs> what kind of lady do you want to be? Do you really want to be a woman who's faithful to her husband? Or, or would you like to have the option to sneak around if it suited you and just not get caught? See, this is the point David's pushing. What kind of person do you want to be? Do you want to be a person who lies if you can get away with it, but don't, doesn't lie if you can't get away with it? We all have to come to a point where we say, uh, uh, I'm deciding to be this kind of person. All right. And not to decide is to decide. Do you see? So the psalmist says, how does a person who really has decided, I want to be a good person, I really want to be a good person, I don't want to just have a good image, I just don't want to make a good impression, I really want to be a solid soul, I want to have a noble self, I don't want to have regret, I don't want to live with shame, I, I, I want to have a quality of personhood that is pleasing to God, that's what I really want. Now, when a person decides that's what they really want, then David says to them, well, I've got advice for you. You've got to pay attention to the word of God. How are you going to become the right person you want to be? You're going to have to have instruction on what a good person really looks like. And now, where are you going to get that instruction? Uh, I know people who can quote more of Dr. Phil than they can of uh, Jesus. Uh, their idea of a good person comes from a TV talk show host. Uh, church, surely you know that's not your best option. If you have made up your mind you really want to be a solid person, you want to have a good soul, you want to be a good character, well, then the first place you have to turn is you got to look and start paying attention to what does the Bible say about being a good person. What, has, what record has God left that said good people are like this? Good people do these things. Uh, and then David said, I made up my mind I wanted to be a good man. And I started paying attention to the Bible to learn how to be a good man. And from the Bible I learned that I had to seek the Lord with all my heart. Uh, there, I know many people who know a lot about the Bible, but it's never really made them a better person. We have all known Christians that we really didn't want to be around. They, they could quote the Bible to you, but yikes church I have to say okay God teaches this in the Bible but he also is a living being and through the person of the Holy Spirit he goes beyond what the words say and he starts applying them to me as a person what does it mean to seek God with all your heart well first of all it means we seek him intellectually we come to know who God is better and better. Ah, uh, really, what do you know about the nature and the character of God? If I passed out a sheet of paper and asked you to tell me the, the most important things you know about God, what would you write on the paper? Ah, uh, second of all, do you have a plan to come to know him better? What are you going to do this year so when it's August 4th next year, you know God better than you know him now? See, that's seeking the Lord intellectually. That's saying, God, you gave me a mind. And uh, you gave me a mind that can think about you, that, uh, that can process thoughts about you. And now I want to seek you by thinking about you. On multiple occasions, I've given out a bookmarker that has the uh, Westminster Confession definition of God on it. 
I guess I'm going to have to give that out again. Uh, how many would like to have one of those? All right, I'll do that bookmarker again. Uh, and you can take the Westminster Confession and you can go one phrase at a time and you can think about God. Okay, here's a phrase I'm going to talk to you about in a little bit. God is infinite in being and perfection. That is an intellectual statement. That is a statement that your mind can think about. All right, let's start. God is infinite. What does infinite mean? Uh, without limitation. Uh, God in his fi infinity is able to do anything he wants to do. God in his infinity is able to uh, uh, accomplish anything he wants to accomplish. Uh, uh, God thinks thoughts way beyond we, what we think because we're finite. I start thinking about God as infinite. Okay, how is he infinite? He's infinite in his being. He's eternal. He's immense. He's uh, omnipotent. Okay. But he's also infinite in his perfections. I begin to think about God as infinitely perfect. All right, the second way I seek him with my whole heart is with my emotions. That's where I come to love God as a living being. Church, at some point, God has to stop being an idea and become a person to you. God is more than an impersonal idea. He is a living being. And I need to love him as a living being. For example... When was the last time you said to God from your heart of hearts, I love you? When was the last time in the best part of who you are, you reached out to the reality of God and you said, I love you. I value you. You are important to me. I want to cling to you. Do you see? I stop treating God like an idea and I start treating him like a person and I love him as a living being. And then we love, when, we love, when we seek God with all our heart, we seek him volitionally. That means we start making choices that put God first. I, I, I seek God with all my heart when I start choosing him to be first in my life. And as I put him down on the list, I seek him less and less. And then we love, we seek God with all our heart when we seek him spiritually. This is the idea of true worship. Um, have you ever prayed and really not prayed? I mean, you said prayer words, but your heart was not in it. Anyone? Okay, I've done it. I'm sorry. I'm not Billy Graham. Uh, I've, I've prayed and not prayed in my heart. Okay. That's, you can pray and not seek God with all your heart, or you can pray and seek God with all your heart. You see? Uh, we, uh, we seek him spiritually uh, when we allow the truth of music to influence us. Now, I'm not one who's really influenced a lot by music. Uh, but I know for many of you, uh, music can have a powerful effect on your soul. Okay, but here's the truth too. I can sometimes get the same feeling listening to the Rolling Stones and a worship band. I can get the same feeling. So it's not just you get that music feeling. It's that there is a connection between you and the living God, and there's something about the music that is helping you focus on God. We seek him spiritually when we meditate. Uh, meditation is being quiet and inward and uh, thinking about what the Bible says about God and what the Bible says about life. And then we also uh, we seek him with our whole heart when we worship him. I mean, when we serve him. Uh, 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 our marriage wouldn't have lasted 52 years if we didn't serve each other. Church, it's an important part of relationship. Uh, uh, when I was younger, I used to keep track. Man, I'm way ahead of her. She's not keeping up with me. 
Okay, I learned that was not a good way to do it. Uh, that will get you into a uh, uh, place you don't want to be. All right. Uh, uh, I like this attitude. I'm going to be so far ahead of her, she'll never catch up. I'll never let her catch up. Uh, like the Olympics, you can't score too many points. All right. Do we feel that way? Do we seek God in our service? In the, th in the, in, in the things that you volunteer and, and the service you do for Christ, do you just do an act? Or in that act, are you seeking God? Are, are, is your heart reaching out and saying to him, as I do this, I would like to experience something of you who you are. I would like to experience your affirmation. I'd like to do it in the kind of way that people sense something beautiful about who you are in my life. Church, there is a difference between saying I want to be a good person, getting a few good self-help ideas, and try to make them work in your life. There's a difference between that and wanting to be a good person finding the good ideas, and then seeking the Lord as you try to live these good ideas out in your life. Can you sense there's a difference? Um, and we have to do this every day because the human soul has a tendency to drift. Do you find this? The more you pray, the more you want to pray. The less you pray, the less you want to pray. Anybody? The more you read the Bible, the more you want to read the Bible. The less you read the Bible, the less you want to read the Bible. Do you find this to be true? The more you go to church, the more you want to go to church. The less you go to church, just skip church for a month and see how hard it is to get up on Sunday morning and come back. Do you hear me? The soul drifts. The soul drifts. And so, if I'm really going to be a good person, I have to have consistency. And day by day, I have to be affirming, I want to be a good man. I'm going to be a good man. The way I'm going to be a good man is I'm going to pay attention to what the Bible says a good man is. Okay, person, I'm just using this uh, as humanity, okay, ladies, I'm sorry. I want to be a good person. What does the Bible say about being a good person? Now, how do I take what the Bible says about being a good person and start seeking the Lord in everything I do, asking that as I live life, he's teaching me these principles and they're becoming a part of who I am and not just something that rattles around in my head. I memorized this verse when I was in elementary school. Some of you did also. I memorized it in the King James Version. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Anybody else memorize that when they were a kid? Anybody go to church here when you were children? <laughs> All right. David said, I want to be a good man. The Bible tells me how to be a good man. I seek God. And he works in my life as I seek him. And he makes these ideas uh, effective within me. So I start hiding God's good ideas in my soul because they affect the kind of life I live. Are you hearing this? So I just picked three of God's good ideas. Faith is a good idea from God. In fact, I hid in my heart that without faith is impossible to please God. Now let's take this idea. If I'm going to live a blessed life, I have to have faith, because without faith it is impossible to please God. Now I have to go to work tomorrow. And when I go to work tomorrow, I can go to work tomorrow and I can live like I got my bases covered. If God comes through and helps me good, if he doesn't, I'll be all right. That's not living by faith. Living by faith is, when I, when I get up tomorrow, I say my morning prayers, and I say, I can't be the man I want to be today without your help. I can't think the thoughts I want to think today without your help. I can't have the emotions that are healthy and good without your help. And so I'm trusting you today 
to nurture my faith so that I can be pleasing to you. You see what you're doing? You're taking the idea out of Scripture, you've hidden it in your heart, and now you're applying it in your life in a daily way. Let's do another one. How about qualities of life? What qualities of life do you want? If I said to you, what are some character qualities you want, what would you list? All right, here's a list. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. I take this verse, I get up in the morning and I say, Dear God, I'm not pursuing my own ego today. I'm not pursuing uh, just wealth today. Uh, I'm not pursuing the easiest pathway, these things we talked about last week. That's not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to work and I'm going to do everything I have to do but I'm pursuing more than just uh, my material life. Today, I'm going to pursue righteousness. I'm going to ask you to help me do the right thing all day long. I'm asking you to help me think the right thought. I'm going to pursue steadfastness today. God, I want to be a person that people can count on. I don't want to be flaky. I don't want people to think I say one thing and don't follow through. So please grant your spirit to guide me to be steadfast today. You see what I'm doing? I'm taking, I'm saying, I want to be a good man. I'm going to the Bible, finding what the Bible says about being a good man. And then I'm saying to God, I am pursuing this today. Would you help me do, be this kind of person today? One more of God's good ideas. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and self-control. Man, that's a good verse to say to yourself. I got hard stuff to do today. I got two appointments that I really don't want to do. They could go either way. But dear God, I'm not going to be afraid. You did not give me a spirit of fear. You gave me a, a, a spirit of power. I am capable of doing whatever you need me to do in this meeting today. And I'm counting on you to help me. You didn't give me a spirit of, uh, of fear. You gave me a spirit of power. Uh, you gave me a spirit of love. I can do it all in a loving way. Uh, uh, I'm not going to be beat by temptation every time because you also gave me a spirit of self-control. I'm taking the good idea. I'm hiding it in my heart. I'm breaking it out, and I'm saying to God, I'm seeking you today because you give me a spirit of power, love, and self-control. And those are qualities that I desperately want to have in my life. But God also filled the Bible with events. It's easier to remember a 10-page story than, is, than it is a 10-page list, right? Uh, memorizing a 10-page list is pretty hard. Ah, but a 10-page story, you can summarize in your head pretty easily. There are stories in the Bible that make us better people. For example, the very first story in the Bible is creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I believe that. I don't believe that's a myth. I believe there is a living God who had an incredible imagination, and he created the heavens and the earth. I know we're bombarded with all these other theories. Uh, I've been, I've been uh, insulted at the university because I believe God is my creator, but I can live with it. You know what I can't believe? can't believe this is all random and good luck. I don't have that much faith. Uh, I read The Origin of the Species. I know that finches, they, they changed. But what, here's what else I know. The finches didn't turn into mice. They stayed finches. Do you see? Uh, yeah, their beaks changed, their colors changed, their, their feet changed. But they, cha they stayed finches. They didn't become another uh, species. I believe God created a uh, church. Um, look in the mirror. What are the odds of you evolving one eye with all the stuff that's in it and a nerve that goes to your brain and is wired into the right places? What are the odds of, God, uh, of evolving one? Well, you didn't just... According to their, you didn't evolve one, you got two. And how ironic, they are exactly next to each other on your face. 
You don't have one on the top of your head and one on your chin. They, they got exactly the right place on your face. Uh, and it's not just my eyes. I mean, the whole human body says to me, somebody real smart figured this all out. We couldn't have evolved to be the people we are by random chance. And because I believe God is my creator, I can say to him every day, you created all of this. You know how it works. I'm trusting you to guide me today. The Bible also tells us the story of redemption. We broke the place. God created the world good. He created us to live in paradiso, paradise. And we messed things up. We treated each other poorly. We didn't keep our deal with God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Ah, but the great God, he said, I will not lose my elect. I will not lose my elect. And he came in the form of Jesus Christ. And he lived a perfect life. He died a substitutionary death. He rose from the dead. Listen, he ascended on high, and he ever lives to make intercession for the saints. You know what Christ does for you every single day? He prays for you. Do you hear this? I want to live a life that is conscious of the redemptive story of Jesus Christ. I do mess up. I do make mistakes. Uh, I disappoint myself and I disappoint others. But I have a redeemer and he makes my life better. Uh, uh, he who knew no sin became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. Church. There's also the story that we must all give an account for the deeds done in the flesh. I want that to be part of my daily remembrance of what the Bible teaches. Uh, a person lives differently when they feel like they have to give an account to God for their life than if they don't feel like they have to give an account to God. Would you look at our culture? How is it that we taught a generation that you're not spiritual at all, you're just a biological function. And when you die, there's nothing left, you just go into the dirt. And what result did teaching a generation that produce? It has produced the ugliness that we see on TV. It's produced a disrespect for the law. It's, it's produced uh, 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 the, the tragedy of... Uh, of uh, 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 the south side of Chicago. Church, it is a healthy thing to believe that we ought, must all give an account to, uh, to God for the lives we live. You may get away with doing very ugly things in this life, but you're still going to give an account for it. Do you hear me? God is not... Uh, 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 God is just, and there will be a reckoning. And when we teach a generation that there is no God, there is no reckoning, we get, we get negative results. Can you see? On the other hand, when we learn, as many of us did when we were kids, that uh, 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 every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, it changes how we see life and it changes some of the choices we make, church. Finally, there is the story of eternity. It's written in the heart of God, but we don't know, we haven't read it. All we know is eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. My life is just to prepare me for the eternal life that our Lord Jesus Christ is preparing. Do you remember his promise? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will doubtlessly come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Life is the kindergarten of eternity. There is something far beyond this. There is a, there is a promise of a world in which goodness and righteousness and truth and beauty prevail. 
And that's the world we're, that's the world we're being prepared for. Church, if I absorb these ideas, if I absorb these teachings, it makes me the better man that I want to be. If I don't absorb these ideas and I don't absorb these teachings, then I'm just like everybody else out there. I'm just reacting to the moment. What do I think will work best in this moment as opposed to what does this moment call out of what is best in me? And then David bursts out, you are blessed, Lord. David starts, I want to be a good man. I'm tired of horsing around. I don't like my life when I'm controlled by ugly things. And the way I learn to be a good man is I start paying attention to the ideas and the stories in the Bible. And then I start seeking God. And God meets me and, and he, it changes the way I think and he changes the way I feel and he changes my choices. And then I see that God himself is best capable of doing this because he lives a blessed life himself. Do you get it? God is not saying, I've got an experiment. Why don't you try this? Here's what he's saying. I live a blessed life. My life is infinite in being and perfection. God's thoughts are all perfect thoughts. His emotions are perfect. His choices are perfect. His relationships are perfect. He says, I know how to do this. I'm doing it myself. I'm living this way, and I can tell you it's the very best option. The Westminster Confession. God has all life, glory, goodness, blessedness in and of himself. You know what that means? It can't get any better for God. God lives in such a blessed condition that it is impossible for it to get any better. And the God who is living the impossibly perfect life says, I can help you live a better life. I'm not experimenting. I know what works. I'll share with you what works. And then David says, teach me your statutes because you know how this works. Please teach me how to do it. And that takes us right back to where the sermon began. If you really want to be a good person, how do you become that good person? If you really want to live right and you want to be healthy on the inside and, 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 you, and you want your life to count for something more than just a cluster of days, then we go to the source. Listen, we go to the teacher who's doing it himself. He's living the blessed life. God is eternally blessed, and he alone teaches us the right ways. Listen to this. What an honor to have God himself as our teacher. Do you believe that? The God of all glory and majesty, the God who is altogether beautiful, the God who is right and good in all that he does, the God who loves us with an infinite love, he says, I know how this works. And I'll teach you. If you want to live a blessed life and you want to enter into a blessed eternity, Christ is your only option. The only one who can set you on the right path. The only one who can teach you. The only one who can guide you. The only one who has prepared a place for you is Christ himself. And he's modeled the right course for every single one of us. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your teaching. Thank you for these good ideas. Thank you that you have this worked out. Thank you that although we get confused, you never get confused. Thank you that although that we are weak, you are strong. Thank you that you are gracious, merciful, loving, kind, and good. And thank you that you're, you call us to seek you and promise that we'll find you. I pray for myself. I pray for everyone who's here this morning. I pray for those who are watching online. And I pray that you would stir up within us that genuine desire to be the people you created us to be. And then I pray that we'd seek you day by day 
and we would grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.